All right, so we're going to talk about the condo lattice today. Um, and that's the uh, the model right here, illustrated in this picture, where you've got conditional electrons in one band moving around. Sorry, there's a little delay. Okay, oh boy. <laughs> okay, now you can see the conditional electrons uh, in one band and the spins, uh, which are another set of electrons. And in this simple picture, there's one uh, one spin for each side of the conduction electron. And we'll take some density rho C of the, of the conduction electron. Um, of the conduction electrons have some dispersion epsilon K. Uh, again, there's a little delay because we can't see it right now. Or maybe you can. Uh, and there's a condo coupling JK. Uh, between the conduction electron C uh, and the local spin. So we're just going to apply the, the large end method that I described at the end of last lecture for a single impurity. Um, and really the only, the only difference from procedurally in the calculation is the extra sum on I uh, on this. And in fact, that makes life even simpler because of the sum on I, momentum is conserved by this interaction. Uh, and so you can just work in a fixed momentum basis and everything is pretty diagonal in it. Okay, so what you do is you uh, decouple this interaction by the hubble stratonovich transformation after writing the spins in terms of this fermionic spin-ons F alpha. Um, and then you get a mean field theory for the Lagrange multiplier that imposes the constraint that there's one spin-on per site. Um, and the hubble stratonovich field that decouples this, which just like last time, we're going to call P. So then you get a mean field Hamiltonian, uh, which will be a Hamiltonian of the heavy Fermi liquid, uh, which is shown right here in equation 53. Um, so there are two variational parameters, if you wish. Uh, one is P bar, which is the saddle point value of the hubble stratonovich field. Uh, and the other is lambda bar, which is the saddle point value uh, of the Lagrange multiplier. And what P, P bar does um, is couple together uh, as if they were free electrons. So it's sometimes called a hybridization and the P bar is sometimes called a hybridization boson. Uh, one of the time it used to be called the slave boson, but uh, I think when do you call it the hybridization boson? Um, and this hybridizes the, the conduction electron C with the spin-ons F alpha. Okay, so now it's just a matter of taking the Hamiltonian, finding its ground state and its ground state energy as a function of P bar and lambda bar, uh, and then solving the saddle point equation, demanding that the ground state energy be stationary with respect to variation in P bar and lambda bar. Actually, and that's important, uh, it's not necessarily a minimum because uh, as cert certainly as a function of lambda bar, uh, because the, uh, the fluctuations of lambda bar are in the along the imaginary axis. So it's really actually a saddle point, uh, which is a, uh, on the real axis, it's actually a maximum respect to lambda bar, and minimum respect to P bar. Anyway, that's a little detail. So now you, it's a task of solving as a function of you know the dispersion epsilon k uh, and jk uh, for the values of p bar and lambda bar, so you know in principle that's a simple task, uh, very similar to the task for the single condo problem, and you get very similar looking equations. Uh, the value of p bar is just the expectation value of c dagger f in the Hamiltonian I just wrote down, and this is the constraint that you have exactly. Uh, half an electron per spin uh, on the F sides. Okay, so there should be no sum on alpha here, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, and the nice thing is that the sum on K uh, uh, appear, uh, you know, very naturally. And also this Hamiltonian uh, is diagonal for each K. So this, in fact, is simpler than have mixed with the K. So it's just a two by.
So now we can go ahead and solve these equations. And if you want to work through all the algebra that's in the notes, but I will jump ahead to like a pictorial description of what the solution looks like. So that all the algebra is spelled out and I'll tell you what happens. Okay. So let's start with a case where P bar is zero. So if P bar is zero, then there's some conduction electron with some dispersion epsilon K. Um, and we assume that there are some density rho C, which is less than a half. So these conduction electrons will sit in this region uh, up to some Fermi wave vector, which is called Kf star, okay? And the F electrons are decoupled from the conduction electrons because P bar is zero. Um, and so they have to be exactly half an F electron for every spin because the total number of F electrons on each side is one. Uh, and the only way you can achieve that for free F electrons is to put them exactly at zero energy. So if they're exactly at zero energy, the Fermi function is one half at zero energy. And so you'll get the needed uh, F electron density. All right, so there's two band. One band is exactly at the Fermi level when P bar is zero. Uh, and the other band is the conduction electron that you just happen to have. Okay, so now you're gonna turn on a P bar and it's a somewhat complicated set of equations you have to solve to figure out the value of P bar. But when you turn on P bar, uh, these two bands will hybridize, as we say, they'll mix with each other, a simple two by two matrix. Uh, and you'll get these bands, EK plus, uh, and EK minus, okay. All right, so now we have to, so that's for some value of P bar, uh, which is small. And now and is, uh, is, uh, so, but now we see that, you know, there's, uh, they're mixed into some band EK minus, so that F and C have lost their individual identity, they've hybridized. So really the easier constraint to impose is that the total density of uh, electron is one plus three. And so since rho C is less than one, uh, you can see that this requires the Fermi wave vector to move out. So the Fermi wave vector will be way out here, uh, and this band will be occupied. Um, and also you notice that since this is far away from the intersection point, small. over here, the band is extremely flat because it was totally flat to begin with. And now you did some little mixing over here. Uh, and so it's still pretty flat. So now immediately from this picture, you see the two very important conclusions uh, subject to the uh, fact that P bar is small, which I haven't yet shown you. Uh, one conclusion uh, is that there is a Fermi surface which counts uh, with a large uh, KF or sometimes called the large Fermi surface, which counts both the spins and the conduction electrons. So the conduction electrons are basically dissolved into the Fermi C. I'm sorry, the spins have dissolved into the Fermi C and the Fermi surface has become large. So this is the, okay, so that's point number one. It's a large Fermi surface. And this is effectively due to the condo effect. Uh, the, the spins become part of the uh, conduction electrons. And second, since the band is so flat here, uh, the effective mass of the Fermi at the Fermi level is extremely large. Um, so the velocity of these electrons is very small and the effective mass is extremely large. So that's the heavy Fermi liquid. So this is the picture then, uh, what's called the H HFL. Uh, which is, uh, you know, well observed and thoroughly studied phase of the condo lattice. Uh, and, and this simple theory that I presented actually fits a remarkable amount of data, including detailed data of the spectrum using STM in recent years. Uh, so it's, it's a, you know, quite a remarkable theory from one point of view, uh, because if you look at the Hamiltonian uh, that we started with, um, which is right here, you know, this Hamiltonian, then there's nothing telling us that these spins are actually made of electrons. They're just some set of qubits. They could equally well be, you know, quantum dots, or they could be superconducting qubits. It could be anything, uh, you know, anything that people are building with quantum computers. 
any two-level quantum system. So, and a two-level quantum system is, you know, it's, it's, it's some kind of bosonic degree of freedom. So you have a bosonic degree of freedom, uh, which is sitting on every side, coupled to these conduction electrons. Those are definitely fermionic. They're moving around, they're ordinary electrons. But this, you know, it, it has its origin in the F electrons, but it need not be. In principle, it could be anything, uh, any qubit at all, made up of a Rydberg atom or anything. And amazingly, we find these qubits uh, in this theory become fermionic. They become uh, fermionic spin-ons, which then hybridize with the conduction electrons and form this large Fermi surface. So from that point of view, this is you know, quite a shocking result, you know, which is experimentally uh, thoroughly verified that this is what, uh, this is the basic picture. Uh, of course, in the experiments, no one's done experiments with fake uh, qubits. Some people done other experiments only with electrons. So maybe it's not that shocking, but uh, there's a lot of evidence. Uh, and qubits in the Okay, uh, so the only thing left to explain this picture is why is p bar small? And I won't go into the detail, they're all in the notes. You just have to solve the saddle point equations. Uh, and when you do it, you find that p bar uh, is basically, it has an expression very similar uh, to the condo temperature. There's an extra factor of two, that's really the only difference here. Uh, the absolute value of p bar is very similar to the value you get for the condo impurity problem. Uh, and it's exponentially small when J K goes to zero. So when the condo exchange coupling is small relative to the Fermi energy, uh, then you get an exponentially small P bar. Um, but it's always non-zero, and as we'll see in both, uh, for the structure of the theory, at least for the model I presented. Uh, and once P bar is non-zero, then these qubits become effectively fermions and electrons and you get a large Fermi surface where the effective mass is basically one over p bar uh, so it's exp exponentially large um, and you know experiments it can be as high as a thousand or something like that okay so that's um, where i wanted to be at the end of last lecture that's basically a summary of the theory of the heavy fermi liquid uh, which was all worked out in the uh, I would say mid by mid 80s, all everything I've said was understood, none of it by me. Uh, and uh, so, yes, so now there's a question. Uh, why don't we take spin spin interaction of the Hamiltonian of the condo lattice? Uh, great question. That's exactly what I'm going to do in a minute. Uh, and then we'll find that P bar, in fact, can sometimes be zero. And that leads to a whole different structure. Uh, Okay, so that's a great lead in to exactly what I'm going to talk about next. Uh, where we're going to, so, so the phase we've got, the phase of matter we got at the end uh, is a very conventional phase in the sense that it's smoothly connected to the non interacting electron limit. Even though the F electrons have large, strong interactions, the final state is just a Fermi liquid um, and it can be adiabatically connected to the free electron state. Uh, the only difference between the free electron state and the heavy Fermi liquid is that the effective mass is a thousand times larger, but you can smoothly decrease thousand to one uh, just by varying some parameters. Okay, but now we want to talk about you know really new phases of matter in principle, uh, which are not smoothly connected to uh, the free electron state, uh, and that's the topic of today's lecture. And and such phases of matter. Uh, necessarily have emergent gauge fields uh, and they can lead to violations of the Lattinger theorem. Um, and first I'll show you how that happened in the condo lattice. Uh, and then I'll turn to how such things could happen in the Hubbard model, but just only one band where it's a little more trickier to get it. Okay, so let me talk about the condo lattice. Uh, so this is a phase that uh, uh, Sintel and Matthias Voita and I have called FL star. Uh, there are similar ideas coming out of DMFT where they call it orbitally, orbitally selective mod transition uh, and so on. It's pretty much the same thing. 
except in our formulation, we pay close attention to the role of the emergent gauge fields in the topological structure, which uh, the DMFT approaches kind of ignore. Okay. All right. So the key thing uh, I just pointed out and also anticipated in the question, what we found was that as JK goes to zero, if we looked at the saddle point equations, uh, P bar was always non-zero. It was exponentially okay. And once P bar became non-zero, the two bands hybridized and you got a large Fermi surface. So now the question is, is it possible to get a state where P bar is zero at the saddle point? And as we'll see, the moment that happens, uh, there has to be some bizarre stuff going on. Um, you will have to have gauge fields. Uh, otherwise, theory doesn't make sense. Okay, so, so to do that, to get P-bar zero, at least at mean field level, uh, we have to include the spins exchange interactions between the spins themselves. So we call that J as opposed to JK, which is the condo interaction. Uh, and so here's a picture, where's the picture? Okay, I don't have a picture. Anyway, so there's a, there are two couplings now, uh, uh, JK and J. Okay, so now we proceed in exactly the same way. We write the S in terms of some fermions, uh, and then we decouple the J interaction also by another, another hubbard totanovich field. So that field I'll call Q. So now we have another field, Q, uh, which is uh, going to, into, decouple the spin-spin interaction, and so Q will couple to F dagger F. Okay, so I now have three fields. I mean, so that's the only difference really. Previously I had two variational parameters, P and lambda, and now I have P, Q, and lambda. Okay, so we want to look for what does Q do? It's a non-zero cycle point value of Q do. Uh, at first glance, it seems not to do very much, just changes the dispersions of bands a little bit. But the most important effect, uh, which you find after some careful analysis of the equations, that it allows a stable solution over some range of parameters where P is exactly zero. You couldn't get that without having J non-zero. The moment J is non-zero, at least in the mean field theory, then you get a new saddle point where P is zero. Uh, both P and Q is non-zero will be very similar to the theory we've already discussed. Okay, so what, but before we get to the structure, I have to now come back to the, to the key important point uh, is this presence of a gauge symmetry. So ultimately this is related to the fact that we have a local constraint. We have a conserved quantity on every side of the lattice. The local was F here, uh, I up, F I up, plus F dagger I down, F I down, is equal to one. And this is true for every i. Uh, so there's a conserved quantity on every site. Uh, and every time you have a conserved quantity on every site, you have a symmetry on every site. And a symmetry on every site is what we call a gauge symmetry. Uh, um, and so you can do a gauge transformation even as a function of time and space where you rotate the phase of f uh, by constant phi and then P by the same phi, and lambda behaves like the time component of a gauge field, and Q, you can see transformed as the difference of phi i minus phi j, because Q is now sitting on the bonds. So that's another important difference, is that the P field was sitting on the sites, whereas the QC field sits on the bonds. And so its gauge transformation um, is a little different. Um, and it's easy to check that under this transformation, the, the full Lagrangian, which is not written out here, uh, is completely exactly invariant. Okay, so now what we see is that if I look at this and imagine I take the slowly varying uh, phi and call the phase of Q as an AIJ, then AIJ transforms like this. And if this is slowly varying, uh, then this is exactly uh, the transformation of the spatial component of a gauge field. This just becomes the gradient of phi. What we have now is a bona fide gauge field here whose spatial components are the phases of Q um, and whose time component 
is is lambda itself. So we have all three components, and there's a U1 gauge symmetry. The other important thing to realize is that the electromagnetic, you know, the electron number symmetry, which couples to the physical electromagnetic field, uh, is completely different. It's not this transformation. Under the physical field, the physical electrons uh, transform. So, in fact, I made a little table. I jump ahead to which is really the table is the is the key thing to everything to understanding all the phases of matter we get. So there's U1, ordinary U1 is the ordinary electromagnetic gauge symmetry. We don't have any fluctuating. We think of the electromagnetic gauge field as a very small perturbation. So it's really a global symmetry. So under the global symmetry, C has charge one, but P, the hybridization boson is also has a charge because you know there's a term in the Hamiltonian, uh, something like P, F dagger C. So this has to be electromagnetically neutral. Uh, and so if, and F certainly doesn't have any electromagnetic charge, it's just a spin on. So if this C has a charge and P has a charge. So that's the physical electromagnetic gauge field. And the gauge symmetry I just told you about um, has C is neutral, but F and P have charge. Okay. And we'll come to that U1 diagonal in a minute. So that's the most interesting one, which is a combination of these two, uh, which really determines what goes on in the two phases. Okay. Uh, so, the, but for now, I've just talked about these two. All right. So that's the structure of the gauge fields. Um, and now uh, we go ahead and uh, solve the saddle point. So, so like I said, uh, we uh, we when you look at the structure of the equations, which I'll write up, which are all written down the notes and uh, you know greatly discussed in some detail, uh, you get a solution where p bar is not zero, just like before, and q bar is also non zero, and that is the old heavy Fermi liquid, nothing new going on. Uh, but there is another solution where p bar is zero. Okay. And this we're going to call it's a new phase of matter, which is FL star, where P bar is zero. So when P bar is zero, if you look at the effective Hamiltonian, uh, you see that there's no mixing between the F and the C. So basically, if I want to write down to zeroth order the band structure of the fermions now, I get two decoupled bands. I get a band for the C. Uh, which is the conduction electron band. Uh, so I'm going to go back to this famous picture. In fact, the picture now looks like this picture, like this one here. Uh, there's a conduction electron band, which basically remains as it is. And the Fermi wave vector of the conduction electrons will remain at Kf star. This is So the Kf star will become the Fermi wave vector of this phase that we call Fl star. The F band is not totally flat. Uh, the F band has some dispersion, which comes from the Q because Q is not zero. The F band would look something like this. I don't know. This is the F band. Well, actually, it will. It has to be half filled. So to get that exactly right, let's say it goes causes there. So that's the F band because Q is not zero. Uh, it has some dispersion and really the. the then the p equals zero solution is unstable as we look at the saddle point equations. Uh, okay, so now you have two decoupled bands. One is the f, and uh, as far as electromagnetic field is concerned, so that's a spin-on band, and that forms what we call a spin liquid. Whereas the conduction electrons are just uh, going along doing their merry thing. Uh, as they were, it's as if they're not even coupled, at least in theory, to the F band. So that's the, at least in the saddle point structure, it's a stable solution uh, for suitable set of parameters, uh, which we call FL star, where you have the conduction electrons uh, forming a small Fermi surface, Kf star, and at the same time, the F electrons are forming a spin liquid. Uh, some could be any kind of strange spin liquid that's determined by the structure of the QIJ. Uh, and that spin liquid 
the most important property of it, it has some emergent gauge field. And, and the reason it has an emergent gauge field is again, something you can see from this uh, gauge transformations here. So what happens here? And the key is really to look at uh, the gauge transformation of P. So P is a boson. And when P is not equal to zero, what we can say when P bar is not equal to zero, uh, that implies we are in the Higgs phase. Because whenever you condense a boson and it's a boson with unit charge, then that's like being in a Higgs phase of a gauge theory, you know, almost analogous to uh, the, the Higgs boson of the weinberg salon model, which has fundamental charges of SU2 and U1, and that breaks the gauge symmetry completely. Uh, and what we learned from the Higgs theory is that the gauge field A uh, is massive. Uh, most more precisely, there's no photon. Okay. Uh, okay, so here I put the massive in quotes. So this is in the HFL phase where you have a massive gauge field. I put it in code because really, if you look at the spectrum of the gauge field, uh, it doesn't actually have a pole at some Higgs mass, like the physics at the Higgs field of the weinberg salon model. Uh, it's a whole continuum. And that's because this is a gapless phase that we're talking about, which has a Fermi surface. Uh, and so it can pick up some particle hole, uh, some weight from the particle hole continuum uh, all the way down to zero energy. So it's an overdamped massive photon, shall we say. Okay, but how about FL star? In the FL star phase, P bar is zero. So therefore now, uh, this is not in the Higgs phase. There is still, there is an emergent gauge field which can have a photon. Uh, of course, the structure of the photon can depend a lot upon exactly what's happening to QIJ. Uh, and this leads to some topological order in the spin liquid. Now that second, that last sentence is the, you know, the topic of literally a whole field of research and a broad classification uh, is, exists for both gapless and gapped uh, spin liquids, which certainly I won't get into, but any one of those possibilities allowed. So you get some kind of spin liquid phase, uh, which is, must accompany the small Fermi surface of the conduction electron. Okay, so Rebu has a question. Is there any experimental evidence uh, for the overdamped boson in the heavy Fermi liquid phase? Okay, um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm not, uh, oh, y y y there is evidence for the, the P boson. So the hybridization boson as being, it uh, shows up as some kind of peak in the optical spectrum. Uh, is some that's the the p boson is the analog of the higgs boson the question is is there any evidence for the analog w and z bosons which would be a massive photon over that massive photon i i'm aware of it yeah. uh, it just becomes part of the particle hole continuum okay shubro has a question what is obtained by condensing p squared instead of p uh, is it just a VCS superconductor? Okay, I'll. <laughs> uh, I've forgotten now. So I think you get, uh, I think there's a paper by uh, Sentil and others. He can answer that question. I, I believe you get uh, what they call, uh, uh, what is it called? Oh, no, no. <laughs> uh, it, it sounds strange now. Yeah, what do you call it, Sentil? Orthogonal metal. Thank you. Metal. So I worked on that. <laughs> Thank you, Sentil. All right, so we won't. Okay, so there's, a, as you can see, that's the whole opening of a whole field of research. But let me just say something. What is the connection to all this topological stuff to the, to the Luttinger theorem? So the basic structure of the Luttinger relation uh, is that every time there's a U1 gauge symmetry, there has to be a Luttinger relation associated with the U1 gauge symmetry. Or, or any, any kind of U1 symmetry, gauge or global. Uh, and sometimes this is a trivial statement that uh, 
uh, you know, the band must, you know, there must be a gap or something like that. Uh, but anytime there's a U1 symmetry, there's a lot of gas prevention. It's also true for a system of bosons. Now, normally we don't talk about it because what happens when you have a system of bosons, the bosons condense uh, and that breaks the U1 gate symmetry, U1 global symmetry. And so then only when the symmetry is broken, then you can throw out the Leidenberg theorem. There's no Leidenberg theorem left over. But if there's any unbroken U1 symmetry associated with that, there is some kind of Leidenberg theorem. So what's happening here? So what's happening is the following. If you just look at this table, everything becomes kind of clear. Uh, hopefully you can see the table, there it is, okay. Uh, so what happens is, let's actually the tricky part is to understand the heavy Fermi liquid phase. So in the heavy Fermi liquid phase, we know that P bar is not equal to zero. Okay, so P bar, now naively you would say that P bar carries both the electromagnetic charge, this U1, and the gate charge, this U1. So you would say, okay, both those symmetries are broken, but not really. Uh, there's a diagonal symmetry, that's U1 diag, where you rotate both. So you can take U1 cross, you know, you can take the sum and difference of these two gauge transformations, U1 gauge. And so you take, when you take the sum of them, that's unbroken because it has under U1 diag, P has zero charge. So you just take the sum of this, this plus this is one, one plus zero is one, one minus one is zero. So there's a, Diagonal symmetry that's unbroken when P bar condenses. So that tells us there's a Luttinger theorem only for the diagonal symmetry. There's no other Luttinger theorem to worry about. The other one you don't have to worry about because that the other combination, the difference is broken. So there is no Luttinger theorem. So the diagonal symmetry uh, is unbroken. So there's a Luttinger theorem for that. But under the diagonal symmetry, both the F and the C carry a charge. So the Luttinger theorem counts both the number of F and C electrons and you get a large Fermi surface. Okay. So that's, I think the correct interpretation of the large Fermi surface state. But in this language now, the F, the FL star state is very simple to state, FL star where P bar uh, is equal to zero, or well, P bar is not condensed, then you have two, two Luttinger theorems to worry about. There's a lot in the theorem of U1, and there's a lot of the theorem of U1 gauge. So under the lot in the theorem of U1, only C is charged, and so you get a small Fermi surface. Under the lot in the theorem of U1 gauge, only F is charged, and then you'll get some constraint on the, that gives you some constraint on uh, the spin liquid. And there's some, you know, there's, there's a whole subject on that, uh, on the effect of symmetries and anomalies on topological phases of matter. And, and this is just the baby version of that. The fact that there's a constraint on the spin on Fermi surface, if there is one, or if it could be Dirac points, uh, that comes that comes from the U1 gauge part here. Okay. So, so that's, uh, that's now then the first example in my discussion of a non-trivial phase of matter then this FL star, uh, which in which, uh, at mean field level, we see a conduction electron Fermi, small Fermi surface coexisting with a spin liquid uh, and the existence of uh, an emergent gauge field on the spin liquid is really crucial for allowing us to conclude that uh, the Lattinger, proper Lattinger theorem has a small Fermi surface. Okay, and I think Sentel will give a much more sophisticated interpretation of some of this. He may, I'm not sure, but there's a very nice paper by Central and Dominic Els, which discusses this in a much more modern language. Okay. I think that's what I wanted to say. All right. Uh, okay, how am I doing on time? I'm about halfway through, that's perfect. Um, okay, any further questions on FL star and what I've said so far? I have a, a naive question. Um, yeah, go ahead. Why please. Well, why do you term it a liquid? A, a liquid certainly indicates a state that isn't ordered, but also suggests that it's dense, or is it just a term that's adopted? I, this is a naive question. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, spin gas. Uh, yeah, it's just it's just what we call it. I, I never thought of that, but it is it is a dense state in the sense there are one spin on on every side. Uh, so it is a dense state, and there are strong interaction between the spin ons. We can't. I mean, in the end, we often end up using a free spin on picture for uh, for approximating the state, but uh, it it is dense. I mean, you could say the same thing about the Fermi liquid also. Uh, the Fermi liquid is called a liquid, uh, but actually, ultimately, uh, our low energy theory for it is the gas of non-interacting particles, fermions, but we just call it a Fermi liquid. So when we have a true liquid of fermions, we now we, we tend to call it a correlated Fermi liquid, or you know, that's the strong correlation liquid yes so you make a good point <laughs> hey, there was also okay, a was question um in, in the chat that i missed i apologize if uh shantanu asked if q can be a two form did you answer that two form uh, yeah can no, q capital q be a two form it was some time ago so i apologize for missing it <laughs> Uh, I don't know of an example, but I suppose it could be if you, if you, yeah, uh, not in the simple, not in the structure I'm discussing. By two form, I suppose you're talking about, can you have a theory which has some uh, uh, subsystem gauge symmetries or something like that? I don't know. Uh, okay. Uh, I don't Well, it'd have I'm to not, be in higher dimensions, right? As a yeah. two form. It'd have to be in higher dimensions. Just yeah, to yeah. I there may be some strange examples, but that's not what I'm referring to anyway. And I'm not an expert by any means of that. Uh, question by Yogendra: How do we know when to consider uh, gauge symmetry seriously? Why the gauge theory is low energies only? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think the point is that. Uh, you know, gauge, yeah, it, it determines the full spectrum in the end. So when we say that, you know, what does it mean to say that you have a gauge symmetry? Well, you know, by introducing redundant variables, you can write almost any theory as a gauge theory. Uh, the question is, is that a useful description over certain energy scales? Uh, now in the heavy Fermi liquid, the gauge symmetry uh, is broken and now, or it, you could say it's confined. And so then it becomes a question of, uh, you know, how strong is, how strongly is it broken? So, or how strongly is the gauge field confined? If it's very strongly confined, then yes, you can just ignore the gauge field. Uh, and it's very strongly broken by Higgs condensate, you can just ignore it. But if there's some intermediate regime over which uh, it's not confined, and you have some kind of asymptotic free regime uh, of free, in around, uh, then you have to worry about it. Okay. And in some cases, the gauge field could, you know, they could have discrete gauge theory, like in a zero gauge field, where the gauge field is always massive, uh, but you still have to worry about it to fully understand uh, the spectrum of the system, not just at low energies. Okay. Hi, Subir. Uh, okay. Can I ask you Great. one more question? Yeah, please go ahead, Subha. Uh, so uh, if you are sitting in the heavy Fermi liquid and sort of phase disorder the P boson, is it, do you get to FL star again? Uh, naively, yes, that's what I would say. Yes, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Unless there's some other condensate that appears, yeah. Okay, all right, so I'll start. Okay, so this is what I've just talked about uh, as a function of say the Heisenberg coupling J uh, at uh, what am I showing? JK, a function of the condo coupling JK, then at large condo coupling, you have the heavy Fermi liquid phase uh, whose trial wave function will be projection onto, uh, you know, sorry, let me just remove this. Uh, of a, you take a slater determinant of C and F, and then you project onto one F per site. And FL star 
which appears a smaller JK, you project onto a wave function which has a slated determinant of F times a slated determinant of C. So this would be some trial wave function you could put on a computer uh, and compare the energy of this state with that state. The most important difference here in this case, there's a single determinant where the two bands are hybridized. In this case, there are two determinants. Okay, so uh, so I can't uh, help mentioning this very nice, exciting recent paper uh, by James Analytus uh, on uh, cerium cobalt indium five. So as a function of uh, doped electrons, they see uh, this is from measurements of the Hall coefficient. This is a region with antiferromagnetic order. Uh, then they see a region without antiferromagnetic order, a small Fermi surface and a large Fermi surface. Um, these are various computations of the Fermi surfaces in the two states, and these are various quantum oscillation frequencies. So uh, it seems that they see both phases, but okay, this paper is still a preprint, uh, hopefully. And there have been other earlier measurements which suggest that there is indeed this FL star phase. Okay, so now let's go to the Hubbard model. That will be the remaining 20 minutes. Okay, so the Hubbard model, we're just going to take, uh, you know, electrons in a single band, and that's the crucial model of the high PC cuprates uh, with some dispersion epsilon P with some repulsion U on each side. So uh, if you have exactly half filling, then you have an insulating antiferromagnet the only repulsion is when you have two electrons on the same side, there's the energy U, and that prefers that the spins align in this antiferromagnetic manner. Now to get high TC and all the other exciting phenomena, you dope, you move some of the electrons uh, and uh, they hop around with me. So if you speak to all this, see something analogous to what we were seeing in the condo lattice. Uh, so the question now we can ask, suppose this thing is a metal, uh, what is the carrier density? Well, one point of view would be to say that uh, the number of electrons that you're seeing here uh, is one minus P, where P is the density of these holes, because they will start around one per side. So the number of electrons in this picture is one minus P. Uh, and so in the free electron picture, the number of holes is one plus P. So the number, the size of the Fermi surface as measured or holes should be one plus three. But another point of view is that you see the whole, it's the holes that are moving in this background, because there are hardly very few doubly occupied sites. And so the density of carriers should be P. So it's either one plus P or P, depending on how you look at it. And that's very similar to the difference between FL star and FL, uh, because FL star had density P and FL, A, FL had density one plus P. So it's a very similar type of issue, except here there's no obvious way to write down an FL star because you only have one band. Okay. Uh, right, so the Luttinger theorem, if you just talk about the global symmetry and don't worry about any emergent gauge fields, uh, tells you the Luttinger theorem, uh, the size of the Fermi surface should be one plus P for all U and P, okay. Uh, and this idea is behind what's called the vanilla Fermi liquid, vanilla theory of ITC uh, by these famous authors. You just take a slated determinant of C and then you just project out sites with, you know, with two, ele two electrons. And that would be our trial wave function, a vanilla wave function for the metallic parent of the cuprates. Uh, and the effect of the projection, very similar to the common effect in the heavy Fermi liquid would be that uh, the Fermi surface remains the same as the free electrons, but the, uh, but the uh, quasi particles become heavier. And this is sometimes called, in this context, called the Brinkman Price enhancement. And the effective mass of the quasi particles should be one over P, but you still get a large Fermi surface. Okay, so that's the vanilla theory of. Uh, metals in the cuprates or a single band Hubbard model. Uh, but if you actually look at the experiments, uh, that doesn't seem to work too well, at least at small p. Uh, so there's a Fermi liquid phase at large p, 
where you do see exactly one plus p holes. Um, but what's going on at small p in this, what I'm going to, following many other people, call the pseudo gap metal is still a question of some debate. Uh, you know, you don't see in photo emission any kind of uh, big complete Fermi surface. Sometimes it's called the Fermi arc spectrum. Uh, and so what is going on here? All right, I don't think there's a settled question, although, you know, people have strong opinions. Uh, what I want to discuss now in the remaining 20 minutes is a possible FL star type model for the single band Hubbard model. And some support for this FL star type model comes from this very recent paper, uh, which measured angle dependent magneto resistance, uh, which has some very, in the underdope regime, has some very strange angle dependence, uh, which you know, can be modeled at least in some very simple model by, by some kind of FL star like uh, Fermi. Well, they say it looks like antiferromagnetic order. Uh, that's not quite FL star, but all right. I don't want to get into that. Excuse me, Santo. I, I, I just want to, you have more like 10 minutes left, not 20, just so you know. Okay. Uh, and my name is Subir, but thank you. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. It's so early. Yeah. It's, it's fine. Now I'm, I'm, I'm really delighted to be confused with Santo. It's, it's usually the other way around, and then Central gets really annoyed, but uh, I, I, I'm very happy. <laughs> okay, so I, I, no, okay. I can annoy you. So no, actually, they... <laughs> no, I'm not annoyed. Uh, so the pseudo gap metal uh, as FL star, okay, it's an idea that in some form or the other has been around a lot. And here are many papers by many people who have talked about uh, something like this, uh, particularly this paper by Wen and Lee. In '95, um, and I have also no shortage of papers talking about it. Uh, what I want to present today is just a very simple physical picture of how you could possibly get an FL star on a single band model, and then a new idea I give to Yahoo Zhang on how you can actually compute things with it. Uh, all right. So here's the picture of how you would get an FL star in a single band model. So you start with this dope and magnet. Uh, then of course you get rid of the magnetic order. So the spins form singlets. Uh, and now these start doing, you know, forming an RVB state. Uh, and in this resonating valence bond, the holes can also move around. Okay. So these, as you see, the holes are getting charged plus E and they're not carrying any spin in this background. And in some theories, they could even be fermions. So what you would obtain there uh, is, um, since you have fermions moving around, you'd obtain what's called a holon metal. You get a metal of these objects, which are charged plus C and spinless. Now that's not what's seen in the experiments. I don't, I think there's almost no evidence for such a state. Uh, because what's seen are these Fermi arcs, and on the arcs, there are actually electronic excitations, spin a half charge E, not spin zero charge E. So this is the whole on metal state. Okay, so how do you get, that's not what you would call an FL star. So how would you get FL star? Well, you now have to imagine that there are also excitations where these spin singlets can break apart into spins. And these spin-ons can also move around. This may cost you a lot of energy, uh, but then it may so happen that a spin-on and a hole-on like to be near each other. They gain some energy by being near each other, by hopping back and forth like that in some simple model. And so maybe they form a bound state. And that's the green objects. It's a bound state of a spin-on and a hole-on. So you can see I've gone a very complicated route. I first fractalized the electron to a hole on. And then I put them back together into this green object, which is sitting on the dimers, which has the same quantum numbers as an electron. So, you know, that seems like a lot of work for nothing, but there's one very important difference. The number of these green dimers that can now moving around, which have the same quantum numbers as an electron is not one plus P as it was or one minus P, sorry, in the original picture, it's P. Uh, so now I have a bunch of fermions of density P. Okay, now I'm talking about holes, sorry. 
uh, carrying charge plus E. And so these can form a Fermi surface uh, and that's FL star. All right, so that's a very complicated way, but it's at least a picture that you can have in your mind on how you could possibly get uh, the wrong Fermi surface of, which violates the Lorentz theorem. And you can see this requires again here, all these resonating blue bonds uh, to be also present. And that's why there's also an emergent gauge field. Okay, so now in the, in the remaining five minutes, uh, let me uh, give you a, a new set of ideas that we've been working with, uh, which I find to be after so many years of struggling with this problem, uh, to be much, much easier to work with. And it allows you to really work things out in some detail. And, and the key idea here, one way to put it, is you know you should we should avoid fractionalizing the electron. I mean that's been the theme of all the papers I mentioned. You start with an electron, you fractionalize it, and then you form some spin liquid, and then you put the electron back together. Why go through all that trouble? And when we did the theory of the condo lattice, we never did that. The conduction electrons never were fractionalized. What we fractionalized were the spins. Uh, so we're going to do take the same approach here. Uh, that's one way to see what we're doing. So you start with the Hubbard model. Now there's an exact representation of the Hubbard model um, as uh, uh, electrons coupled to a boson, a spin one boson phi. Uh, I should really call it a rotor because it can have any arbitrary spin actually. Uh, so this is just a Hubbard Stranovich transformation. Uh, you take right the Hubbard interaction this way, and then you decouple. Uh, the, the phi field itself uh, uh, is, carries angular, you know, spin one because it's a vector in spin space, uh, but it doesn't have definite angular momentum. You know, it's, it's really a, a rotor. So let me put it here. So this is another way to write it. If I put some kinetic energy for phi, this is the angular momentum of a rotor. You can think of it as a particle on a sphere, moving on a sphere uh, with some moment of inertia which can have spin zero, spin one, spin two, and so on. Uh, and this is coupled to the electrons. And this is formally an exact representation of the Hubbard model. Okay. So I have a bunch of quantum rotors coupled to electrons. Okay, what I'm going to do now is take these quantum rotors and fractionalize the rotors. I don't want to fractionalize the electrons. I'm going to fractionalize the rotors. Uh, I'm going to write the rotor as a, a uh, bunch of coupled spins. So I'm going to replace each rotor by two spin a halves. You can form a singlet or they can form a triplet. And those are very precisely the two lowest levels of a rotor. So we throw out the spin two and the higher spins that are present in the quantum rotor model and just have spin zero and spin one, which we represent by these two spin a halves. So now I have this coupling J perp, and now I'm going to call this coupling JK. Uh, and there's formally an exact representation of the Hubbard model. I have coupled the original electrons, which are now free electrons, by a condo coupling to a spin ladder. And it's very important, it's, it has to have the spin ladder. I can't couple it to just one layer of spins, it has to be two. Uh, because only then do I get this mapping to the rotor model, which I can derive from the Hubbard model. Okay. Excuse me, Subir. Yes, yes. Yeah, you have five minutes left, including the questions, which, but All we right. can incorporate that. So, but. Okay, okay, Robert. So let me just now, okay, the, just, so now that you see this, and I'm just finished in two minutes, if you don't mind, uh, skip all that. So now this model here has one phase, where these spins, you know, just form singlets. And then the conduction electrons move around and you just have the large Fermi surface, no big deal. But now what we're going to do, and this, uh, you know, anticipated by the fact that I call this coupling JK, I'm going to take the top two layers uh, and have, the, have them form a heavy Fermi liquid, just like I did in the condo lattice. So when I do that, uh, they'll form a large Fermi surface with density what? Well, this has density one minus P. This has density one. So when, I, when, they, when this thing turns on, just like in the condo lattice, uh, then 
I get density of here. So this is holes, which is two plus P, uh, which is the same as P because everything is modulo two. So in fact, I get a small Fermi surface, one plus P plus P mod two is P, and these two will combine to give you a small Fermi. This layer that's four gives you a spin lake wave. And that's FL star. So here's an actual wave function. The first time sample, someone had a simple wave function, you form a slated determinant of the first two layers to form a large Fermi surface. And a slated determinant of psi two gives you uh, a spin liquid, and then you project everything into singlets uh, so that you get rid of these degrees of freedom. So this is now a wave function which only acts on the physical electrons, and it has a small Fermi surface. All right, so that's really all I want to say. Now you can start from this point and build up a theory of all kinds of fun stuff, including the phase transition between them. You can do calculations and you get these from the arc like spectra. We've also uh, done various things. Uh, there's another paper coming out with lots of computations of the antinodal spectrum. Uh, and it, uh, you know, it, and it works <laughs> remarkably well, but uh, I'm not going to conclude that uh, the pseudo gap is FL star. Uh, but at least there's some physics of Apple star over some intermediate temperature regime. Uh, I think that's uh, a pretty reasonable point of view. All right, so uh, those are the conclusions and thank you very much. Thank you. Are there, uh, I, I don't think I missed any further questions in the chat. Are there other questions? Um, it, 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 if not, could, could I ask a naive question? It's just, I, yeah, I mean, I could imagine that you have these kind of highly anisotropic Fermi surfaces arising because of the lattice structure or, you know, the complications of condensed matter systems, but that's not what's happening here. I mean, here, the picture you have of this arc. So what's determining like the size of the arc and, you know, why is it fourfold and, or it just, it depends upon the details. I, I apologize if this is, I, I clearly wasn't absorbing everything, but I mean, it's a beautiful Right, so picture, many things but... do depend on the details. Oh no, good question. Yeah, okay, so this is the experimental data. I mean, many things do depend on the details like the fourfold uh, symmetry and so on. Uh, but what's, so, First of all, on general principles, if this, if this is actually a Fermi surface, Fermi surfaces can't end. So I think most people would accept that there's probably some very weak, uh, uh, the arc is really a circle. So, but also this is at finite temperature and at low temperature, other things kick in. So, you know, we were, we we're talking about a, some, trying to impose a zero temperature picture on some low temperature regime, which I think is a reasonable thing to do. So in our theory, yeah, there is a little, little okay. So all the details of the shape of this and uh, do depends on all kinds of horrible band structure. But what is shocking and really that what requires a new set of ideas uh, is that the volume enclosed by this Fermi surface, no matter how complicated its shape, uh, doesn't obey the Lattinger theorem because there is no obvious broken symmetry uh, breaking broken and translational symmetry in this region. Um, and so if you accept that, uh, then you're forced to think about more exotic phases. Yeah, so it's the volume enclosed that's the mysterious thing and that we're working so hard to describe, uh, not the shape. The shape is, you know, depends on all kinds of details. Okay, okay. So if you had a hexagonal lattice, you might have six patches yeah, yeah. or, okay, okay. Right. Okay, very so, good. Oh, you get some very complicated for this, it depends on all kinds of detail. And then there's this topological statement that the volume enclosed by this complicated Fermi surface, no matter how complicated, must equal the total density of electrons, mod two uh, per unit cell. Uh, so that's a very fundamental theorem, and uh, one of the you know emerging realizations in the last twenty years of research is that uh, this theorem can be violated, and that violation is very much connected to emergent gauge fields and topological structures. And 
So this yeah. whole complicated ancilla structure that I was describing is one way to get that uh, get that topo the, the, those gauge fields. So because what you know when we we added these two layers and then the top two layers formed the pockets that we want. But the theory told us, and it's great that it did, uh, that there that's not all you got. You got the small pockets that you wanted, but theory tells us you can't get a theory that only has a small pocket. It's got to have the spin liquid and the topology, and that's sitting in the second layer. So you can't just throw out the second layer. It's actually required by the structure of the theory. So of course, to really test this picture, the second layer should somehow be observed in the lower energy spectrum. Uh, and that, that hasn't been done. Very good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay, and uh, right.